Just the word suffering a lot, and it's as a perspective for reflection or as a counterpoint for the the aspiration, because the aspiration is always ha happiness. You know, in terms of of human beings want to be happy. <laughs> we just it's just we're you know we're we're kind of hardwired to want to experience happiness and well-being. We're looking for it in so many ways, and to recognize that there are ways that 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 are efficacious and there's ways that actually frustrate our 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 desire for for happiness so that that perspective of recognizing well yeah okay i want happiness but why do i keep butting my head up against this suffering all the time <laughs> or this sense of discontent or dissatisfaction or disease uh so that, that's one thing that, that as, a, as a goal or as a perspective, uh, say the Buddhist teachings emphasize suffering, but also in terms of the actual way of practice, the path that's laid out, all of the constituents of the path are things which lead to happiness. So that, say, the path that is grounded in ethical and, and, and virtuous conduct is, is something that brings us happiness and well-being. The, the path of uh, meditative awareness and concentration, uh, these help to settle the mind and bring the mind to a point of happiness and well-being, so that you're nurturing happiness all along the way. Wisdom and the ability to discern uh, things in their, in their true light brings a great deal of happiness and delight into the mind, so that the whole path is one that is uh, one is cultivating the factors of happiness and well-being. Um, but the, 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 the counterpoint that one is using to use as a mirror is, is this working, is this not working? Uh, is, is there any discontent, dissatisfaction, dis-ease, suffering that still needs to be worked with? Or, and how do I work with it? Somebody who's seeking happiness through sort of acquisition um, will never come to an end of their desires. It just, desire builds on desire. As soon as you get this thing, you want something else. Um, and so the next step is really like learning to see through that, or at least have faith to try um, to go the other direction and see what effects that has in your life in terms of cultivating more peace of mind and happiness. And so it's like, so, ah. Uh, I want that, I can feel that I want that in my life, or I want a nicer car, or a better house, or uh, a new iPod, or whatever kind of shiny, glitzy sort of things that are obsessing your mind. Um, and, uh, and taking a second look at that in question, you say, well, I felt like this about that before, didn't I? And this thing, and that thing, and, and here I am just wanting more. The Buddha's teaching, and particularly his teachings about uh, liberation, revolve very much about breaking the cycle of addiction. He calls it dependent origination. How, how ignorance and, and craving and suffering are all in, intrinsically interrelated with each other. The, the essence of the insight that he had at his enlightenment was into that process. When there's ignorance, it leads to craving, and if craving is pursued, then it always leads to, to suffering, to unhappiness. If you stop the cycle, if there's no ignorance, if we're really awake to the way life is, then, then uh, the craving doesn't arise. Maybe there's a feeling of like or dislike, but there's, it doesn't hatch into craving and clinging and pursuing the object, believing that that's the thing, you know, that big deal on the stock exchange, that great, you know, the, the Pulitzer Prize winning photo, you know, the, the, the great novel or the, or the, the new car or the, that, um, that tequila that just you know, goes down like water, that, that, that hits the spot and makes me feel great. <laughs> that uh, there's no, um, you know, regardless of, of what the object might be, you can see that even if there's a feeling of, of attraction or interest, then it's not picked up, it's not pursued. It's like, yeah, well, I, that's, that's, that's attractive. Yes, when you get praised, when you win the, big, win the big prize, that's very sweet, but I don't have to live for that, I don't have to make that the center of my world. 
if the prize comes, great. If it doesn't come, that's fine too. Um, so no suffering ensues from that. So that that was the insight that the Buddha had, not particularly about tequila and <laughs> stock options, but but um, that was on the night of his enlightenment. He saw how the, those things are connected. If if the mind is truly awake, then there's no suffering. If as soon as we don't see things clearly, as soon as there's ignorance, not knowing the way things are, then the mind drifts into uh, the the tokens of transcendence made by money or or oblivion or thrill, or, you know, excitement of you know, sexual nature or, or material possessions or of social status, whatever it might be. Those become tokens of transcendence. That having money equals I'm I'm a person of substance, you know. I now have, I am. And then, and then when they fail to deliver complete happiness, then dukkha, suffering, kind of comes from that. There's never been a particularly strong monastic tradition in America. I mean, most people, the only monastics they would meet would be the, the nuns that teach in Catholic school. And... Uh, but for most people in Europe, the, 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 when people see you dressed in, in robes like this, then they, they automatically assume you're some kind of a monastic. That there's, the, the, there's a recognition of the renunciate principle. And in countries like Ireland, even when you explain, well, actually, no, we're, we're Buddhists, we're not Christian, you know, we're nothing to do with the Pope or with, with the Catholic Church, they sort of nod and say, oh, yeah, you know, right, I understand, and then... So, so which church do you belong to then? You know, that you've, got, <laughs> you've got to be some kind of a Catholic, you know. But they don't really care when you try and explain, no, the Buddha lived 500 years before Jesus, but not connected to, to the Christian church at all. It's like, well, so what? You know, you're, you're some kind of a monk. And so that they're, the, the, they're interested in you, they're inspired by you, or they want to connect with you because you're representing something of that archetype. And the details of the theology are... are so, by the way, and even when, uh, you know, we're like living in England, we've had monasteries there since the late 70s, so nearly 30 years now. Even for like local people and you know, farmers around the area, when, when we would have our retreat time for three months and we wouldn't go out on the arms round, because we walked through the lanes, the pathways and the country lanes around the monasteries, going on arms round uh, most of the year. And then, you know, in the springtime, often the farmers say, where were you? We didn't, we didn't see you all winter. Where you been? You know, they, uh, they have no particular interest in, in Buddhism or have not studied it, but just the sight of, of nuns or monks walking through the fields along the pathways down the lanes, that touches people, that affects people. They, there's, a, there's something that is moved by that, that recognizes, oh, this is to do with uh, the spiritual life. And, that, uh, and maybe that's a little bit weaker in America because of the, the particular history of the, the white community in this country in the last... 250 years, 300 years, but um, it's it's still there. I think within the human heart, it's like the in the Buddha's story, uh, the the four what are called the four heavenly messengers that made him leave the life of a prince and the life of luxury, and um, take up the life of a religious seeker. You know, the first four was a, were uh, the first three were um, an old person, a sick person, and a, and a dead body. Uh, a corpse on its way to the funeral, being carried to the funeral. But the fourth one was a religious seeker, like a wandering monk. And that was the one, the fourth one was the one that, that said, you know, that, that caused the Buddha to, to realize, I can do this. You know, there's, there's, there's a way to understand uh, the nature of human life and, and uh, perhaps this, this uh, path of renunciation. Because he asked his his charioteer, well, you know, what's this fellow doing with the, you know, with the dreadlocks and the long beard and the, the, the brown robe? He said, oh, he's a, he's a religious seeker. He's in search of the, the deathless reality. That's what, that's what yogis, that's what religious seekers do. They, they commit their lives to awakening to ultimate truth. And then that was the spark then that caused the Buddha to, to recognize, yeah, that's, that's the only real, really important thing to me even above my, you know, the kingdom and the family and even his wife and child. That uh, 
said that if I really want to fulfill my life and do the best that I can for them, as well as the world, then this is a path I can take. And so that caused him to, to leave the household life. So that, that uh, what you're doing as a monk also is you're, you're flying the Buddhist flag. You know, you're, you're, you're playing that role, in a way, of the fourth heavenly messenger, of the, the renunciant. And it's so many times, you know, people, they haven't got a clue what you are. I've had people that come up to me in the train station in London, just waiting for a train, and a complete stranger says, um, I want to thank you for doing what you're doing. I think in terms of uh, you know taking Theravada Buddhism as its um, say what is its its core characteristic, uh, and it would be the the uh, uh, focus on practice uh, and training and trying to follow the teachings of um, virtue, uh, of developing of meditation, and the cultivation of wisdom. So those are the central sort of bits that are, are uh, down uh, from the Buddha's time that followed the, say, the path that he laid out uh, in his first teaching. Because um, in, the, in the very first teaching that, that the Buddha gave, he outlined those, uh, those four basic truths that he was pointing to uh, of the unsatisfactoriness of, of ordinary existence, uh, that there's a cause to that dissatisfaction being various types of desire and attachment, that there is, a, there is an ending, there is a cessation of that. Uh, one can be liberated from that sense of dissatisfaction. And there is a path leading to that liberation. There is a path of training. It isn't something that is bestowed on one or that one beseeches from something external. It's something that you cultivate your yourself, relying on the teachings, relying on the example uh, of the, the Buddha himself and the successive generations, and it's a, a, uh, the communities that one lives and practices with, and it revolves around that, that cultivation of, of virtue, um, the, having a, a moral foundation or a foundation of virtue and goodness, uh, a basis of calm, clarity, uh, steadiness of mind, concentration, uh, that peacefulness of heart, and then the aspects of wisdom <coughs> that are uh, understanding clearly just what is the what's the true nature underlying things that we experience. What's its what's its basic characteristic? As one sees that clearly, uh, then there's a radical letting go, a radical. Uh, freeing of the heart. When I first got interested in Buddhism, I had this kind of fuzzy notion of what enlightenment was, um, like most of us do. And it's some huge, grand thing that we can't quite get our minds around. Um, but what drew me to practice more than that sort of grand idea was was the sense of just wanting to make my life better and learn how to live in a, in a way that's happy and peaceful. Um, as I came to study the teachings more, the Buddha's definition of what enlightenment is seems more realistic, which is you know, learning how to eliminate suffering in our lives and live in a way that we don't suffer anymore. Um, and instead of searching for this kind of mind-exploding event uh, or some sort of great sense of uh, bright light dawning on our <laughs> dawning in the middle of our meditation experience you know it's 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 really well-defined and focused on learning how we suffer and create